your only Son with us, to accept our incense and to fill us with his heavenly graces, that we may thank his Father and his Holy Spirit forever.
Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. And From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaim life to the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our soul. Remain silent, O listeners, and the Lord's Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the Word of the Living God. The Evangelist Luke writes, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee, called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, <clears throat> he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what had been said, and she pondered, what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found great favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God shall give him the throne of David his father he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born shall be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your cousin, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her, for her who had been called a barren. For nothing shall be impossible for God. Mary said in reply, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the truth. Peace be with you. Why does God appear 
on the face of the earth? We have two answers, but we can say three. The first one is the primary answer. It is composed of those who hear and who respond to that word of revelation. You'll note in the epistle today that it's from the letter to the Galatians. The letter, this letter was, is probably St. Paul's first letter, written in the late 40s. And its whole gearing is toward what is faith and how faith is the great Amen. It's the intellectual and a response of the mind and of the will, amen, the affirmation to God's revelation. That's the personal response. That's what makes me be put onto the path of salvation. For those of us when we're babies and we're baptized, that's why we have godparents. They speak in our name at that moment to make that ascent of faith. And then, of course, as these little sponges grow and absorb everything from us, their parents, we were meant, we are meant to communicate that faith to them so that when they reach the age of reason, it becomes by that point already second nature. And they themselves at that point, in that age of reason, respond to the Word of God themselves. And they are also then by that placed personally on the path of salvation. So I mentioned there are two other answers we can give to this. The other answer is materially. Someone who is baptized and whose name is in the register. Yes, they're Catholics. Yes, they've entered the church. But that's just materially. Baptism is only opening the door. The personal engagement and ultimately we call salvation, that healing, each person has to engage with that faith, with that baptism, or else salvation will be lost to them. That's the second answer. There are many names. When you find, they'll talk about there are 1.2 billion Catholics in the world. Yes, they've been baptized, they've been consecrated, and their names are on a list somewhere. But how many of them are personally engaged in the path of salvation? God only knows. Because that requires my freedom, my intellect, my will, personally, to engage with that healing power of grace on the path that we call redemption, salvation. And that's why the third aspect of what we're talking about here is in the epistle. This response to God's communication to us. This morning in the office of Safra, the morning office that the church recites, there is a magnificent one-line part of the prayer from the Etro. The Etro is the prayer that we read at the end of the incensation. And after the offering of the incense, we sing our hymn beautifully. And then there's a little prayer at the end. That little prayer is called the Etro. And etro in Aramaic means fragrance, perfume. And it's considered the offering of this act of our prayers and our incense and our offering of our hymn. We bring them in a summation all together and offer. And the incense ceremony is the center of everything we do in the Syriac tradition. And so it's also part of the morning office. No, I'm not here at 5 a.m. by myself offering incense in front of the altar. But the prayers themselves are still recited. And in the monasteries and the convents, that incense ceremony is being performed. But there's a line from the Etro, which is significant on this day of the announcement to Mary, in which we ask to free us from the bonds of sin and make us holy temples, the plural, Make us holy temples where your divinity shall come to reside. Now it's in the plural because it's pointing out that the individual has to respond to the word of God. For those of us, again, who were baptized as babies, thanks be to God that our parents had at least enough of faith at that time to bring us to the baptismal font. They initiated us on the path of salvation. But that individual 
individual engage, engagement of these consecrated people within the temple of God, the church, has to be engaged. And therefore we pray. Remember, these are baptized individuals. Pray, free us from the bonds of sin. Break these shackles. Break this ignorance and this self-centeredness that I know is part of my life. Give me knowledge of it. Break the bonds. And make us temples. Make me individually then a place where your divinity can come and dwell. It's a very simple prayer, but very profound. And that is in correspondence to this response of Mary of Nazareth. Remember, she's probably only 16, 17 years old when this takes place. They couple it together with the reading of this letter to uh, the Galatians. And when you read through it, it looks all kind of confusing. Abraham, the promises in this, and that's before the covenant, and that's why you should do this, and you finish with that. And you're like, okay, fine. I put the bulletin down. And the bulletin's only one page because it took me all week just to get the computer back up and everything downloaded. So you get, you're lucky to get one page. <laughs> but at least I wanted you to have the epistle before you, not just simply a citation of its references but the actual text so that you can see what St. Paul is trying to communicate. It is clear what Our Lady does before Gabriel in Nazareth. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Nothing is imposed on her. The angel in communicating the word to her tells you these are the things that will take place. But they're not imposed on her. The angel waits for a response. Do you acquiesce to this? Do you engage in choosing with this? And of course, we have that beautiful answer at the end. Behold, look, I am a mere handmaid, a servant of the Lord God. And the word that you have announced to me, let it be done according to me in my life. Come, make me a holy temple, a dwelling place of your divinity. In a very unique way, obviously, with Mary of Nazareth, but one which is meant to be replicated by grace within each of us. And so this epistle is taken because, as I mentioned, the whole letter is to the Galatians, and Galatia is more or less kind of like central Turkey today. And the Galatians, many of them are pagans, many of them are Jews from their con before their conversions. And he's writing to the Galatians because he's complaining, you're all trying to follow these rules of Judaism. Circumcise your boys. Don't eat lobster. Don't eat clams. You can have blueberries. These rules that are part of the Mosaic law. And he says, are you, have you lost your minds? He says in an earlier part of the letter, you lost your minds. Christ has come to make you free. Why? Especially you who come from a Greek background, a pagan background. Why are you following rules that were given to the people of Israel 15 centuries ago? And so he goes through this whole thing of talking about that the faith, this engagement, this amen, this response of affirmation to God's word is what makes us free. But it's not just yippee yahoo, Christ came and we do whatever we want. That's an idea of a lot of people these days. We don't have to follow the law, we don't have to do this, God is love, so just do whatever you feel like. That's absurd. Our Lord came to bring us healing and light grace and illumination. And that illumination is present, which is why St. Paul then talks about Abraham. Now Abraham lives 500 years before Moses. It's important in our heads to kind of have the scale. And as we talk about the word, God speaks to Abraham in his life. This word appears in his life like an eruption. It just appears. And Abraham responds. But the main promise that St. Paul is emphasizing today is that when God says to Abraham, in your seed, I will bless all the nations of the earth. We talked about last week about the fact that this went on for decades. With no children, nothing, no, sterile, barren. But the reason why St. Paul is emphasizing this promise is because this is something that God said to Abraham as a promise. 
at his own initiative. When the people of Israel 500 years later are brought out of Egypt, out of the bondage and slavery of Egypt, they're brought to Mount Sinai. You know, the clouds, the crashing thunder, the lightning, and the horror of the whole thing. Don't touch this mountain or you will die. You will be put to death. And in the midst of all that, Moses comes down and he communicates to them a law, Torah. But it's presented to the people of Israel to say, do you accept these observances, these directives? You won't eat lobster. You won't eat shellfish. You won't mix milk and meat. These types of things, these dietary laws, and all the other things around circumcision and the rest of it. They're rules, they're observances. They are things to do. They are not faith. Faith is his engagement with a person who communicates with him. God appears as man and becomes man on the face of the earth historically. He has come to engage with us on a personal level. Judaism and Islam, those are rule books. They are observances. Which is why you have certain movements among them to kind of make them more devotional. For Islam, it's Sufism. For the Jews, it's Hasidism. But the fundamental religion that they observe are rules. They're observances, things to do, because the hidden God of majesty that we have really no direct relationship told us to do these things. But in Christianity, the hidden one of all majesty appeared among us and said, I love you and I desire that you respond to me humanly and respond love for love. Now in one way, that's quite liberating. Who cares if your boy's circumcised or not, eh? But on the other hand, it's much more demanding because now I have to be engaged to follow the footsteps of Christ. Whether my son is circumcised or not, he either is or he isn't. There isn't any kind of in-between. So whether my heart is being transformed into the image of Christ, when do I ever say that's good enough? When can I ever say that I've reached that full accomplishment? So from that point of view, it's much more difficult. So that what St. Paul is saying is the promise which is made to Abraham is unilateral. That's why in the epistle, if you look at it, he talks about angels and intermediaries and all that. He says that when, because on Mount Sinai, when this was presented to the people and they agreed, you be my people, I will be your God. It's a bilateral contract. Follow these rules. Follow the rules and I'll be your God. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And so what St. Paul is saying is that this bilateral intermediary angels on Mount Sinai and Moses is two. That's why he says in this letter, but God is one. Humanity is one. The wounds of sin are one. Salvation is one. Grace is one. It's all one in God's plan. God's initiative. What is church? Church is God's initiative to radiate the world with light and grace and holiness and to wait as the angel Gabriel, how do you respond? Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. May it be done unto me as your word has been said. That is the response which makes church, which makes parish. Not just names in a book, a register. I have hundreds and hundreds of names in the book in the office. But the response is what makes the path of salvation. Which is why he says, and this is the letter where he says, St. Paul, that the law was a pedagogue. The pedagogue in the classical world, paidos in Greek means a boy, child. To where our word encyclopedia comes from, encyclopedia. It's a circular about of books and stories for children. That's the original meaning. You're teaching. But the, the pedagogue was not a teacher. Pedagogue in the classical world was your servant, your slave, who took care of your children, the nanny, and oversaw their moral education and took them to their teachers, made sure they were safe on the road. But the pedagogue only led 
surrender to the teacher. What St. Paul is telling the Galatians, when the rabbi, when the teacher came, when Christ was born to us, the pedagogue, the law of Moses, no longer has a function. The pedagogue was around while you were in minority. Once you became an adult, no one has a nanny following them around in 35. Though probably some of them should. They'd be better off. But the idea that St. Paul is bringing up here is to say, look, the law of Moses was for a period of time. Why are you following these observances? Because we have been liberated by being brought to the teacher. God himself speaks to us. And so we ask, is that's our freedom. It's not a condemnation of the law. That's why he says, is the law in opposition to God? Well, of course not. But it served a purpose, and that purpose is done. And that's why on this day, when we have this magnificent example during the season of announcements, the ability to hear, we ask for the grace to imitate this young woman, Mary of Nazareth, historically back, so that we each can become, on the path of salvation, those individual temples consecrated by the indwelling of the divinity itself. Again, not the same path as Mary of Nazareth. That's unique, historically accomplished once and for all. But individually, by grace, we are meant to be transformed by that divinity within us. And so that's why St. Paul finishes with this epistle and he says in the last line that the scriptures, he's referring to Deuteronomy, that the scriptures has set up, shut up all under sin, the pagans by nature are not going to be saved. The Jews by their pedagogical teachings of the law of Moses are not going to be saved. But they will all be brought into the light of the Messiah. And he says that so that the promise, the faith, by faith in Jesus Christ, that response of mind and will, might be given to those who believe. That's the path of light. That's the path of salvation. May the Mother of God obtain for us this grace, and may we walk ever more profoundly and steadily on this path of light and redemption. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Spirit, glory to you, to your only Son, and to your only Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O servant of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. Oh, 
that they may be upright and courageous in their apostolic office. May they show fidelity as they stand ever before your eternal justice. Unto your honor and glory, may they prove themselves upright, dauntless, persevering in the task confided to them, to lead all the faithful into fullness of your redeeming light and glory. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace and stability of the whole world, for a blessed and prosperous year, for an abundant harvest, for the sick and the oppressed, for all who call upon your holy name on land, at sea, or in the air, and to profess that you are the true God, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember those who have presented the offering upon this altar, and those who desire to do so but were unable. Grant them their petitions. We pray to you, O Lord.
temptation and from harm of evil. For you have power over all who raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of it, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, in your grace and abundant mercy, bless those who bow before you. Make us worthy to share in your life-giving mysteries and to join the assembly of your saints, that with them we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, and for us. And with your spirit. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask Him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the Holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth. To Him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies can be sanctified by Your holy body, and our souls purified by Your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to You be glory forever. Amen. 